slot. It's, um, it's the slot after lunch when everyone's had their food and they're nice and comfortable and they can sit back and put their feet up and go to sleep. So hopefully that's not going to happen this afternoon. Hopefully I'm going to say enough controversial things to, to keep you awake and um, hopefully some things to entertain you, but hopefully some things that will benefit your farming business as well. The Latin, in actual fact, was pretty spot on. It's non nobis nasimus, um, which, as you've said, is not for ourselves will we be born, but for the whole world. Um, sounds fairly grandiose, but um, that's what it is. So I'm going to do three things this afternoon to try and keep you awake. The first thing is just to give you a bit of background about my farming business, where I'm from, um, and some of the background to my Nuffield scholarship. Then I'm going to tell you what we did when I did my Nuffield. Um, and then after that, how that's changed what we do. Um, and I just want to say as I start, I'm not here as any expert. I'm just a second generation farmer. There's only two of us on the business. I drive the tractor, I drive the sprayer, I, un I unblock the drains. I do all those crappy jobs that no one else wants to do. I'm not here as an expert telling you how to do it. I'm just going to be here to tell you what I've done. If you don't like it, that's great. If you like it, fantastic. So let's get a move on and get through these slides. Where do I point this thing? Where do I, where do I aim it? Oh, here we go. Here we go. So, those of you, geography is not great. The map on the left is United Kingdom. Um, it's built, it, uh, split into four parts, England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Um, the yellow part is England. And if you look at the map at the top right, I think I've got a poker here. Here we go. This is South East England and London is just right in the middle there. Okay, and I farm about where the K of Kent is. Okay, um, within that southeast area of England, there's about 9 million people. Um, and the distance from here to here is about 30 miles. So we're in commuter belt from London. A lot of my friends would get on a train every day and um, travel into London to work. So a lot of the landowners in our area would be those that get a million pound bonus from the bank. Um, a lot of non-farming income is bought just for, for playground um, and we have to compete, compete with that. This is a, a house which was built in 1250 which sits right in the middle of our farm. Um, it's pretty uncommon for here but it's not in the UK. Um, and the guy who owns half of the land we farm lives here. He's an international tax advisor. Uh, but he also, that, this house has got 14 acres of formal gardens, two full-time and two part-time gardeners on 14 acres and on 1,000 acres of land, there's me and my dad, and a lot of the time we're fairly part-time. Um, and in, the, in, and, in and around those gardens, we host 30 weddings a year. It does come with its um, restrictions. <laughs> I was gonna say this is our best road, it's not. It's one of the narrowest to get to some fields, but that's what we have to contend with. I haven't yet seen a hedge in Canada. I've been here a few days, but around almost every one of our fields and alongside every road we would have a hedge like this which needs maintaining with a hedge cutter. Um, can be quite a pain, we're not allowed to take them out, they're protected, but it just shows you some of the restrictions and hassle we can have with a number of people going along these roads. I'm married for 15, 16 years this year, um, I've got four children and this is just a bit of a sum up of what, what home is. So I'll whiz through this. I'm a second generation farmer. Dad started with absolutely nothing. Um, his parents were, um, worked in the city in London and he decided he wanted to go farming so became a farm manager and then slowly but surely, surely did some, we call it contract work, you call it custom work. Um, started to build up a silaging team um, and over the time has saved money, spent it um, and we've got the business we've got today because of that. Married with four children, um, the eldest is 11, the youngest is three, uh, a girl and three boys. We farm about 1,000 acres for eight different separate landowners across six parishes. A parish is like, you normally get a church in a parish, it's like a village. Um, we go about 10 miles to the furthest land. But of that 1,000 acres, we only own 67 acres, so 6.7% of our farmed area is owned. Um, but on that, we've got 3,500 tonnes of storage. It's a family partnership with my parents and myself and my wife. Um, a couple of things we do do and don't do which will, your jaws will hit the floor, perhaps not the first one. We never work Sundays, even during harvest. Um, two reasons, I believe that Sunday's a day of rest. Um, it's good to work six and have one off. Um, I know a lot of friends who start working in March and don't have a day off till October. It's pretty sad. Um, so we do six and have a break. 
Um, and currently we have no borrowings on the business whatsoever. No borrowings on land, no borrowings on machinery, um, no facility for an overdraft at the bank whatsoever. I put an asterisk because I've just taken a loan out to build my new house, but that's the only, only loan we've got on the whole business. And this is the one where your jaws will all hit the floor and shake your head and say he's talking rubbish. We have applied no P&K from a bag on our farm for 19 years whatsoever. We regularly test our soils. Um, the whole farm gets tested every three years using a version of the Albrecht system with an independent soil testing lab and our P&K indices are being maintained or rising. I don't know how, but they are. And if that's the total test you're getting back, why would you put, throw P&K at it? And bearing in mind that 93% uh, of the land that I farm doesn't belong to me, and I've only got a two or three year agreement on it, why would I want to compromise the quality of that land by not putting the right fertiliser on? That's, that's something that's um, possibly exceptional, but there's quite a few farmers now doing that. And in relation to the first presentation of today, perhaps a few more of you might be, should, maybe should consider that. We also haven't ploughed the mobile plough for 18 years on the farm. We don't own one. I sold it about 11 or 12 years ago. Um, for me, it's an absolute terrible piece of kit and should be, should be scrapped. A um, couple of other things I do. Um, I'm on the leadership team of a big church in Maidstone, about the same size of the number of people we've got here. Um, I'm a school governor at the local um, primary school where my children go, two of my children go. And I'm also a farmer director of um, Wheel Granary, which is a grain storage cooperative, um, handling about 100,000 tonnes of grain every year. So I'm fairly busy. Um, something else I do slightly differently, which I think is different to a lot, a lot of farms. This on the left was, because he's just emigrated, my agronomist. Um, so, uh, crop advisor, what would you call it? You have agronomists in this country. Well, he's completely independent. Um, doesn't work for a chemi chemical company, totally independent. Um, his job is to walk my crops, um, give me advice on what the crop needs. George, on the right of the picture, is an independent soil advisor. So his company provides soil, te soil testing services, um, and I pay both of them on an acreage basis per year. So David, his job is to manage what is growing above the ground for the most cost-effective way he can. George's job is to test and maintain that the soils are being maintained in the right way. And the three of us together run the farm. We decide on rotation, we decide on timings of spray application, fertiliser applications. And for me, I've got three heads there um, helping run the business. So I've got the technical ability of George and, and David, um, and then the practical, what can actually be done by myself. David's just emigrated to Kenya um, to do agronomy for 12 farms over there, so I've got a new agronomist who's just started. There's a saying at the bottom here, one generation makes it, one uses it, and one loses it. This is something that my mum's father told me before he died, and it can be quite common, certainly in businesses and farming businesses in the UK, that one generation makes it, starts it, sets it all up, the next one sort of walks along on the coattails of dad, and the next one tends to, tends to lose it. And that's a challenge I've got. I'm the second generation. I've got three boys and a daughter. And I don't, want to, I don't want to be in a position where they lose it. Um, this is me drilling with the drill that we built um, on an area called Romney Marsh, which is below sea level, um, right on the south coast of Kent last year. And um, I mentioned that I did a Nuffield scholarship. I met Blake Vince doing my Nuffield scholarship. Steve LaRock here as well, who'll be speaking later, is a Nuffield scholar. And my father had done a Nuffield scholarship, and I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do it, but I needed a subject to study that I was passionate about. I didn't just want to do one for the sake of it. And I was thinking about, uh, we were tilling very shallowly, one to two inches, um, seeding with a tine seeder. And I kept thinking, why are, we, why are we doing this? Why are we taking a perfectly good soil structure? When we, when we harvest a crop, the soil structure is normally pretty good. And we're taking that perfectly good soil structure, we're ripping it all up with tines and cultivators, and then we're putting seed in and we're leveling it all back down. And other than the stubble being on the surface, what we are left with once we planted the crop is pretty much the same as what we had before we harvested. And I was contemplating that. And then I read this report from the University of Sheffield. Um, and they came up with this study that said that the UK may have as few as 100 harvests left in its soils due to intense over farming. And the study they looked at was that before World War I, the average soil organic matter level in the UK was running at 
After World War II, it was down to 4%, and it's currently sitting at averaging 2% organic matter, which is a pretty serious decline. Um, and I think a looming agricultural crisis can sound like a bit of a headline, but actually perhaps there's some truth to that. Um, and soil organic matter was one, some, one thing I really wanted to look at. And you may know, and actually the guy who spoke before lunch, who was pretty young, had pretty much sum, summed it up well when he said, you know, your soil organic matter is how active your soil can be and how well it can hold on to nutrients. So I want to get my soil organic matter as high as possible. I want to feed my soil with as much residue as possible. Um, so that's what spurred me on. And then I saw this picture on the front of a book that I read, um, and I thought, what if I could do that at home in the UK? Here we've got, a, this is a farm in New Zealand, in the North Island. They're cutting winter barley. They're unloading straight into a, into a truck on the field, chopping the residues, and within five minutes, they're planting the next crop. And that's a crop of um, Italian rice that would be overwintered, grazed over winter, and then they would come back in the spring um, with the following crop. I thought, what if we can do that in the UK? What if we can eliminate all the tillage, all the labor required, all the, um, they, so the guys at home call this the five minute fallow, because really you've got no fallow in there at all. The soil's not drying out, the biology's not drying, you're getting a crop straight back in there to keep the soil alive. So what did I do? Well, fortunately I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to get selected for an Uffield scholarship. And from the outset, I wanted to go and visit the best no-till farmers in the world. The ones who've been doing it for 20 or 30 years plus, um, and so I went to North and South Dakota to see Gabe Brown and Dwayne Beck and Jay Fuhrer. I went to Paraguay and Brazil, where Blake joined me for some of the time, and I went to Australia and New Zealand as well to see some of the guys who've been doing this 20 or 30 years and the benefit they found. And something you can notice from the picture on the right here is that you can't see the soil. And um, that's really, really important. It's actually to keep our soils covered as long as possible. Another day, just a couple more photo snaps from the holiday. Um, it was one day in Paraguay, which I will never, ever forget for the rest of my life. This guy we went to in the morning. This guy couldn't read or write. He had 15 hectares, which is a pretty small farm. I shouldn't think there's anyone here with a, a farm as small as 15 hectares. Yet he was making a living on that 15 hectares for his family and his three daughters. And he put all three of his daughters through university of 15 hectares. That's a, that's a bit of a challenge. He was into cropping orchards with plants up the middle. It was absolutely fascinating what he was doing, and he couldn't read or write. Amazing. And then in the afternoon, we went to see this guy who was on the other end of the scale, and he was farming 9,000 hectares. Um, he was a Belgian chap called Lucas, and he would move to Paraguay in 1982 to 9,000 hectares of scrub. There was nothing there. His dad had bought it, invested in it, and sent him over to sort it out. He'd obviously done something wrong. Um, and when I visited, when I visited, it was 3,000 hectares arable cropping, 3,000 grassland, and 3,000 still in, in native pasture. Um, and he built his a cotton gin, he had a huge grain storage business, a wood mill. Um, and he said this one thing as I left, he said, everyone copies and no one thinks. And if that's one line I leave you today, that wants to be it, is that don't copy what other people are doing. You know, farmers, if, if one thing, are like a load of sheep, they'll see what a neighbor's doing and they'll copy. And I want to encourage you today to think for yourself, like this guy did. He went to a load of scrub and had to make decisions. And he was doing 3,000 hectares of no-till and making a really, really good job of it. So boiling all that down on the back of my Nuffield, I had to come back, I had to write a report, I had to sort of think, well, what have I learned? The first thing I learned and the most beneficial thing I learned was about soil. The importance of organic matter and carbon in our soils, particularly on soils in the UK, which were down as low as 2%. And that's an average, remember, so some of them would have been under one. Um, the importance of roots. Blake's coined the phrase roots, not iron. And it's so important to get healthy living roots going deep down into our soils. We get regularly root, uh, wheat roots down 12 foot deep when we dig a soil, soil pit. And the importance of that, we're not tilling, not ripping that out every year, is really important. People don't mention earthworms very often. And um, when you plough, you don't get many of them. But when you no-till, you get lots. We've had our soil independently tested by two um, university professors, and they found 12 million earthworms a hectare. That's 1,200 a square metre, before you get your calculators out. That's quite a lot, and that improves your water infiltration, it improves, improves your drainage, it improves the um, breakdown of all your residues because the worms come out at night and take it down into their burrows, and healthy earthworm numbers improve your soil. The next subject I found was, um, was water. 
with both how we use our water, but also water to the soil, you know, are we, are we, um, are we saving that? Are we, are we having water that infiltrates well, or is it just running off the top and eroding and taking the soil with it? Are we able to hold water in our soils like a sponge, so that when we get to summer and it's hot and dry, we've actually got some water reserves in that soil, and actually the higher the organic matter percentage of your soil, the higher the ability of your soil to hold on to moisture. And that's a real issue for us. We get some hot winds just at grain fill, sort of July time at home, and I think we lose probably another tonne a hectare of yield because of, because of dry soil. And if we can keep residues on the top, if we can keep moisture in the soil, then that's a, a huge difference to, to keeping um, crops greener for longer. A lot of people want to race out with a combine when they see their neighbour going, but actually I want to be one of the last to start because my crops are still green and they're still growing. And I think if you can manage the interaction of how you look after your soil with how you look after your water, actually you can make a good profit. A lot of people in the UK aren't making profit. We get some, something called subsidies from the European Union, which I hate. I'll take them because they're free, but um, I'd much rather farm without them. And it, they reckon that 95% of UK farmers without subsidy would go bust. So it's a pretty serious issue, but it's not an, a good issue to promote sustainable or even regenerative farming. And I titled my Nuffield Scholarship Moving from Sustainable to Regenerative because the word sustainable gets used too often. People want to sustain everything. And I say to people, would you want to sustain your bank account or would you want to regenerate it? Would you want to sustain your health or would you want to regenerate it? I know what I'd like to do, and I don't want to just sustain a degraded resource that our soils have become. I want to improve my soils. I want to get more earthworms. I want to get higher organic matter level. And so actually I want to improve that, and I don't want to make a profit. I don't think we should apologise for making a profit. We're businessmen. We invest huge amounts of money into our business, and we should be making good profits. And time. We get one life. As Chris said this morning, we get one life, let's use it. And I don't want to spend my life sitting on a tractor. Sitting on a tractor's fun when you're 16. When you're 40 and you've got four kids, I sit on a tractor for a bit, but I get bored. Um, and our drilling tractor now, our planting tractor, is doing less than 200 hours a year. Uh, I think that's a good thing. I get more spare time. I can do things like this. So, breaking that down, I had to come up with four recommendations on the back of my Nuffield Scholarship. And these are four things I think would work pretty much in every, every country of the world. As I say, I've visited a lot of countries and a lot of continents, and I haven't found a soil type yet where no-till doesn't work. I'm sure there's someone here who will say, well, it won't work on my farm. <laughs> there's always someone. But I haven't found a soil type yet where it won't work. But feel free if you want to get your, your phones out and take pictures. I don't mind. So the first thing is to retain our residues. What does that mean? Well, it means chop your straw, don't bale it. If you do bale it, put something back on. Do a muck for straw deal. We want to try and keep soil cover on the ground at all time and build our organic matter. When I was in um, South Dakota with Dwayne Beck, he said to me this, he said, you've got to keep it, I've got it on another slide in a minute, you've got to keep it cool when it's hot and you've got to keep it damp when it's dry. And if you can do that, then you're going to be winning. The second thing is a diverse rotation. At home in the UK, a lot of farmers' rotation was wheat canola, wheat canola, wheat canola. That's no rotation. We need some diversity. For us, we need a nitrogen fixing crop, something like a spring bean. Um, or peas, um, and some breaks, some breaks so we don't get cereal, 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 cereal. That's not so much of an issue for you because you get beans and corn and a good variation. The third thing was to plant cover crops. You can call them catch crops. You can call them even regrowth, actually. Sometimes it's just good to let the regrowth grow. The Americans call them soil primers. Um, and the fourth thing is to, is to move to no tillage. And I've said there's lots of different machines and there's no right or wrong. My breakout session tomorrow, we'll be looking at what we did in particular with the cross-lot drill, which, I, which we like, but as low disturbance as possible would be my recommendation. You could do that with a knife time, you could do it with a disc. Got lucky last time. Uh -huh. Right, so re retain residues, stropping, uh, chopping the straw, and spreading it well. When I look at my stubbles after harvest, I don't want to see soil at all. I want to see covered soil. I just want to see trash, residue. As I said earlier, we want to keep it cool when it's hot and damp when it's dry. This is the rotation we use, we have used at home for the last few, few years. So we've got winter wheat followed by all seed rape. All seed rape for you guys is canola, but it's winter, winter sown. So it's sown straight behind the combine in August um, and established to a good size before winter. And then we, we've got an eight-week gap between harvesting oilseed rape and planting the next wheat crop. And we've got some pretty big cover crops, which I'll show you in a minute, on the back um, of, 
on the back of that eight-week gap, which you think, well, that's not very long, but the soil, you've got to remember the soil temperature is fairly high. We normally get a bit of rain in that time of year as well, and we can get a good size of, of cover crop. We're spending about 20 pounds, um, 20 UK pounds a hectare on that seed, um, which would be about eight pounds an acre, and it's about 1.4, so it's fairly cheap, fairly cheap mix. Uh, another winter wheat, and then a, a more diverse cover crop, which is an overwinter cover crop. But we're still playing around with that, and there's no exact science. My, the next speaker will be far more into that. I used this presentation a few times, so I've just grouped some of the benefits of cover crops here, and there's so many. Um, a lot of people um, put them down because they say, well, the seed's too expensive, I've got to go and plant it. But there's such a benefit with having so uh, cover crops in the soil. And I think the American term soil primers is so important. When I drill into a cover crop, it's just so easy. It's just the easiest thing ever. And you can go in the rain and you can go whatever and it just, it just works. So here we go. We've got um, a picture here from Paraguay. And this just shows um, the difference that you can make to your organic matter in 12 years. And the little guy in the middle was a Paraguayan farmer. And the chap on the left is Rolf Derpsch. There's a guy on the right in an orange t-shirt but he's a quiet Canadian guy I've never heard of him um, and um, the numbers there don't lie these are independent tested results 1.2 percent to 2.9 in, in 12 years that's a massive difference in how this soil and we were walking that and they'd had a huge I think 75 mil the, the week before in about 25 minutes it would rain like crazy and all the all the roads had run and the ditches were full but the fields just walked like carpet it was quite staggering um, how well they walked. Yes, the soil was sticky, but the structure was absolutely perfect. Iguazu Falls, I um, don't know if many of you have been to Iguazu Falls in South America. It's on the border of Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina. And Rolf Derpsch, who, who gave us a brilliant tour for a week, um, sent me this picture. And this was a picture he'd taken um, 40 years ago when he moved to, to Paraguay. And this is the colour of Iguazu Falls when they had a heavy rain. At the time, there was 96% conventional tillage, and that's the colour that the waterfalls would run. Um, when I was there, I took this picture, and it had rained pretty hard the day before. And that just shows you in a pretty simple pictorial way, 90% plus of the locality is now no-tilled with cover crop, and you see the difference in the water. And I would suggest to you that's all your topsoil, all your nutrients, all your P and K floating down the river, which is not the place you want it to be. So what did we do at home? Well, I went home, fortunately my father's first generation, fortunately he's open to making some changes, and he said, right, I can see what you want to do, let's do it. So we sold a lot of old kit to raise a bit of money. Kit we call machinery, you call machinery, I call kit. Um, we sold some machinery, which is fairly aggressive tillage machinery. I thought we can't keep the old stuff. Too many people in the UK would, would go into a new system and they keep all the old machinery just in case, just in case it didn't work. And I thought, we're going to make this work. And if we've got the old, old machinery there, actually there's a danger that we can revert back to it and, um, and, and start you know, farming conventionally. And I didn't want to do that. So I needed the money to finance the new, the new planter, the new drill. So we, um, we sold all this, this machinery and we... This has got a mind of its own, is not it? Uh-huh, here we go. So we... Um, I wanted to build a cross-slot drill. I'd seen it in New Zealand when I was over there. Um, there was only one in the UK at the time. And I went to speak to those guys, and they were trying to import them, and they couldn't give me an accurate price. And I said, well, how much does it cost? Well, it's going to depend on the exchange rate on the day. I said, well, that's not very helpful. Um, I said, well, what if I made it myself? They said, well, maybe. So I did a deal with Baker No Tillage in New Zealand, um, and we imported from New Zealand the opener, openers, we got a local engineer to fabricate this part, which we picked up, and then we built the rest ourselves. Where am I supposed to point this thing? Because it's really temperamental. Um, so we assembled, we imported these, um, these openers, the black pieces, um, and then assembled everything on, on hand, just me and Dad, um, in, the, in the grain store at home. Over the space of six or eight weeks, we put the drill together, um, and there it is pretty much finished. Uh, so it's 4.8 metres wide. The idea was that it matched up with a 24 metre spray boom, 80 foot, um, so that we could tram line, put tram lines down on the, on the third out of five passes. Um, in reality, we haven't done that. So 
4.8 metre width with 21 openers or 21 rows gives us a 9 inch planting row, 228 mil, which a lot of people thought was way too wide for wheat, wheat but we've actually had some of our best yields from it in the last couple of years. Um, it's a seed only drill, we're not putting any starter fertiliser with it, although a lot of other users have done that subsequently with a liquid fertiliser system. Um, and it's pulled by a 300 horsepower John Deere, which is pretty relevant, and it's overpowered. We've got 50 or 60 horsepower there, too much. But it was a cheap tractor at the time. Um, we pull out about 8 to 11 kilometres an hour, uh, which gives us about 10 or 10, 11 acres an hour operating output, comfortably do 100 acres of drilling in a day, in, in daylight. Um, and we're using somewhere around 8 to 12 litres a hectare, which is about 4 to 5 litres an acre of diesel to establish all our crops, which for the UK would be pretty low. Um, so this is the first day out once we built it in July 2014. Um, and here we... Do, uh, July 2014 was a particularly hot and dry year in the UK, so we cut our oilseed rape canola really early. And I thought, well, I've got a gap here, so we're going to get a catch crop, a cover crop in. Um, so we put some linseed buckwheat, sunflower, and phacelia. Combined, it was about 20 kilos a hectare. Um, that cost us about £25 a hectare. So pretty cheap, pretty low seed rate. Just put it into this, um, just to play, really. We'd never done cover crops. I wanted to try the drill. Um, I thought it's best to try it on a on a cover crop rather than the cash crop, because if I make any mistakes, they won't be so, so noticeable. So this is what it looked like after eight weeks, the amount of growth we got. It was sort of thigh high, um, pretty diverse, all in flower. The buckwheat you can see here is in flower. The linseed was just about to put pods out. It looked pretty impressive, to be honest. Um, the neighbours were shaking their heads, thinking, well, how's he going to plant wheat into that? Um, I was thinking the same, actually. Um, <laughs> And here we are. So we, we sprayed it off with glyphosate, three litres of glyphosate um, on the Monday, and we went back on the Tuesday and planted the wheat. And this, is, this part here has been planted. So it's effectively all dead, uh, even though it doesn't look like it. And this is a view out the back just to pr prove I was using the same drill. Um, and actually it worked absolutely fine. Not one blockage, no problems, other than the cosmetics on the top. But I say to everyone, cosmetics don't earn you any money. And this is what it looked like in November of the same year. You can see all the trash has died back. The wheat's come up perfectly. It walks pretty much like the floor here walks at the moment. Mud wouldn't stick to your boot. And just over here, uh, behind these trees, we've got uh, a river called the Medway, which would be similar sort of size to your Thames, I guess. Quite a big river. Um, so we were pretty impressed with that first year out. Um, Another field, just to prove it wasn't a fluke. Uh, this field didn't get quite such a good cover crop, and this is how I left the field once it had been planted. So that's planted field, me, me walking away. And this is the same field, just switching 90 degrees um, on the edge in the December. So it's all come up nicely. It just started to tiller out. You can just make out the tracks from the tramline headland where we would have been with the sprayer the year before. But they would have had... Well, we would do 10 passes with the sprayer, including fertiliser. So the headlands would have had 20 passes on it. And you can see the amount of ruts we're getting in a no-tillage system. So this is the same field a little, a little bit later, at what we call T3, which is sort of the ear, ear timing. Um, and that yielded 11 tonne a hectare um, of full, full spec group one milling wheat, which we worked out at Blake's the other day was 163 bushels. Um, we gave it quite a bit of nitrogen because it's quite a high nitrogen requirement crop, and it's all making bre um, protein. So the 13% protein for us is, is, the, is the issue we're going to, but that would, uh, that would have got me 50% more price. So rather than the base price being about 100, 110 pound a tonne, I was selling that for about 170 the year. So that's why we push it hard with nitrogen. And that was all cut first week of August, all dry. Um, the field just over the road did even better. Um, a variety called Crusoe, group one wheat, planted at 275 seeds into the cover crop that you saw just a few slides back. Um, this crop was so thick that there were flocks of pigeons actually landing on the top of the crop, sitting on the crop and eating the wheat. It was that thick. Um, and that was doing in excess of 12 tonne a hectare. Um, so yeah, we were pretty happy with that. This year, which was last spring, again, crops looked pretty good. Looked like the potential was there for some big yields, but unfortunately we had just the worst 
June and July on record it was really dull, gloomy, no sun, no heat. And so, and this crop still did 10 tonne a hectare, which is pretty good, but it could have done so much more. There's not a lot you can do when it does, the sun doesn't shine. So what do we do at home now? Well, we stripped our machinery right back. Um, between seeding and harvest, the only machine that touches the field is the sprayer, and that applies all the liquid fertiliser and all the sprays. Um, we haven't used any insecticides on the farm for two years now, other than on seed treatments. Uh, we're working to use less and less fungicides. Um, and so we've got a combine on tracks, and we've got a drill and a big set of rollers. And the rollers apply slug pellets as well, uh, ferric phosphate slug pellets. We don't use metaldehyde, just because after canola we tend to get quite a few, few slugs. So we roll everything, and we also got quite rocky soils, so Dad drives the rollers and picks the rocks up. So it's three jobs in one, really. So benefits of a no-till system. I'll just go through some of these and give you some numbers for us. Uh, with going no-till, you will reduce the fuel use on your farm. Absolutely no doubt about it. We're using somewhere between 8 and 11, 11, 8 and 12 litres a hectare. So 4 to 5 litres an acre. Tractor hours, our planting tractor will do around about 200 hours a year. Um, we're reducing wearing metal. When we used to plough, we would change our points, our leading points on the plough at lunchtime every day. And we'd change them again in the evening. So we go through a set every day of plough points. It's pretty abrasive soil. Maintenance time. Time is money. And when we used to employ somebody, you'd have to pay them to do that. So that was another saving. And what I haven't done is, in my presentations, I do quite a lot of these at home, and you can't tell everybody what they're going to save on their farm because every farm's different, every field size is different, every soil type is different, every topography is different. Um, but I can tell you where there are savings to be made. Um, we used to employ a full-time member of staff. He doesn't work for us anymore. So we've got his salary saved. There's reduced soil erosion by wind and water. Improved soil structure and trafficability. The ability of our soils to take traffic is massively, massively improved. And we actually drill at different angles every year, which I know doesn't work with controlled traffic, but for us it's worked, it's worked really well. The water infiltration rates are hugely improved because we're not disrupting that soil. Our worms have free access and they drain the soil for us. We're improving our soil matter slowly. It does take time. The water holding capacity, the, the capacity of your soil to be a sponge and hold water is improved over time. We've got a lot more worms. The roots are cycling nutrients. I think this whole system is just working well. Um, and because we ha don't have to wait for cultivations to pass through and soils to dry out or be too wet or dry, the timeliness of what we do is, is much more spot on. We've only got to worry about the drill going through. We, we seem to get far more consistent germination because the opener is contour following. Each opener is um, hydraulically pressured up and down. So you get a, a, a contour following, following ability. Um, and you can, see, you can see the opportunities there. I'm really not trying to sell it to you. There are some downsides. Um, most neighbours think you've lost the plot, but I really don't care, because I know it's a better thing to do. It's initially not cosmetically pretty, and I think farmers are worried about cosmetics. But I would say one thing. Cosmetics, just after you plant, don't own you any money. It's how it looks like when you cut it with a combine that's important. Um, you need to get over that. Your management needs to be absolutely spot on. You get one opportunity with a drill to plant these crops. You can't rectify um, poor ploughing or poor tillage by another pass of a tillage. You get one opportunity to get it right. So your maintenance of your drill has got to be good. You've got to have the right... Somebody said you've got to have the right nut behind the wheel. which You've got to have the right driver who knows what he's doing. And when there's a problem, he gets out and checks it and sorts it out rather than, rather than keeping going. There's possibly some slower establishment. Because you're not cultivating soil, you're not mineralising nitrogen which you would do with a strip till or with a tine. So you need to work that in. Sometimes we would, we would plant earlier in the autumn or in the fall and go a bit later in the spring when the soils are warmed up. And you've got to think differently. Plants grow in a different way. They grow, grow a bit slower. Herbicides work differently. It's a new system. You do have to change your way of thinking. I saw this picture in a field in North Dakota when I was travelling and I put my money on that being, still being there. Um, in the UK now, we've got a lot of machinery dealers that won't, won't price trade-in machinery for, for tillage now. They were not, they're not interested in taking it into, into stock because so many farmers are going to strip till, reduce tillage and, and, um, and zero till, no till, that they're not pricing any trade-ins. 
for cultivation gear. So it might be a warning to be heeded. I'm not sure it's going to go down here that well at the moment. I think you're doing plenty of tillage. So take home message from my talk is that I think by properly implementing a no-till system rather than a buying a no-till drill, it's a whole system. You've got to understand there's a whole system, not just buying a drill. I think if you think it's buying a drill, you've prob possibly missed the, missed, missed, missed the crux of my talk. But um, it's a whole system that we're talking about. It's a system of cover crops. It's a system of managing your soil. It's a system of encouraging worms. It's a system of eventually you'll poss possibly get to, to buying a no-till drill. And tomorrow I'm going to look at, at some of the ways to adopt 100% no-till. And I'll go through um, Rolf Derp's 10-point plan to adopting a no-till system. So we'll definitely be improving our soils. Of that, there's absolutely no doubt. Reducing our costs as well. I've never met a farmer that doesn't want to reduce his costs. Increased yields. Everybody is, yield is king. Everyone has got to have the biggest yield. In the UK, we call them pub yields. Everyone goes to the pub. You know what a pub is. It's where you drink beer. And um, everyone has pub yields. And the, the world records are in, are, in, are in pubs. Everyone goes to pubs. And they get these massive yields. And um, everyone wants to grow big yields. Of course they do. I believe we can grow bigger yields by going no-till with cover crops over time. It will take five or ten years to get there, but I think we can do it. Um, and I certainly think, well, we are. We are. In the last two years, we're maintaining them or they're going up. And spend less time doing it. We get one life. As, as Chris so brilliantly put this morning, we get the one life. We get one choice. I don't want to spend my time sitting on a tractor. I want to go and do things and enjoy life and, and, um, and see the world. So I don't want to spend time sitting, driving up and down, ruining soil by, by tilling it. And I wanna, I've, got a, I've got four children, and I want to hand over a better farm to the next generation. You know, I think we need to understand that soil can be you know, degraded, but it can also be improved. I believe we want to improve it. We want to hand over better farms to the next generation. And that's me done. We do have some time for questions, so if you have any, please put, hold them up and we'll get them picked up here. I have a question before the, the group ones come up, Tom. What was the toughest uh, hurdle you had to overcome mentally when you made the shift in your farming operation? I think for me the biggest question was worrying what neighbours think. So it was the whole, um, yeah, what, everybody looks over fences and spies on what you're doing and puts it on Facebook and Twitter and, and that's what you've got to get over. You've got to, you've got to be pretty single-minded that you're, going, you're doing the right thing. You've got to do your research as to why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and you've got to be willing to make mistakes. You've got to, you've got to have pretty thick skin um, and you've got to say sort of bring it on sometimes. Um, and be willing to make mistakes and say, well, if we don't try new things, we're never going to learn. And I think sometimes at the moment, people are not willing to make mistakes. They're so scared of failure that they're not willing to step out of the boat and, and try. Um, you know, that, that story in the Bible of when Peter walked on water, there was 11 other disciples in the boat that weren't willing to have a go. But he stepped out and had a go, and he could have fallen flat on his face, and he did after a bit, but actually... So, so often that's... That's the problem, and that people aren't willing to take a w risk. They'll stay in the crowd rather than put their neck above the parapet. And if you don't try, you don't learn. If you don't learn, you don't advance. If you don't advance, you stay the same. So. Okay, we have a few questions that kind of are related to the same thing, so I'm going to ask you to maybe deal with both of them at the same time. Uh, did you cut off PNK told cold turkey? And, and then the second question was do you spray on your PNK so maybe talk a little bit about how you manage the PNK and a second part of that is do you apply manure or compost so it's all in the nutrient yep slide. okay that's probably the most common question I ever get is the whole PNK thing um, no we don't apply anything through the sprayer um, we retain all our residues we put some compost on but very little um, we have applied some paper waste we get paper waste which comes off the um, paper mills which has got a bit of P and K. Um, we've grown a little bit of cover crops recently, but not for the last 17 years we haven't. So, as I say, we use independent soil advisors whose job it is to maintain and look after our soils. And everybody knows that they advise us on our soils, and their reputation is based on, on what their clients' farms look like. 
So we, every time they come, and they come six or eight times a year to the farm, I say, what do we need to do? And they say, well, there might be this. doesn't mean we use nothing. We've used high fos slag, which comes out, out of the steelworks, and applied that with a, like a lime spreader. Um, occasionally we use lime, we might use calcine magnesite, we might use gypsum, we might use different things, but not, not um, artificial fertilizers from a bag. Okay, probably along the same lines of how, how did the neighbors think about this? How well did the landowners accept the changes? Landlords fortunately were very good because I sold them the benefit to the environment. So in my Nuffield scholarship, I told them the benefit of cover crops and bees and butterflies and birds. And in the UK, everybody wants to know about that. They all want to know about the ecosystems in their hedgerow and how much you know, more beautiful the countryside is. And so you've got to sell the public what the public want to hear. So that's what I did. I gave them all a copy of my Nuffield scholarship, which they read. And we pretty much said, this is what we're going to do. And this is why we're going to do it. And we'll try it. Um, and they were all happy to go along with it. So, Good. Um, there's a question around uh, Roundup. You know, based on the assumption that it may not be available in the future in Europe, how is that going to affect what you do in your operation? Okay, well, I've currently got enough Roundup in stock for the next two years. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to buy some more when I get home. Um, it's a serious, serious risk, serious worry. They reckon at the moment it's 50-50, whether we're going to lose it or not. Um, it, the decision will be made in December. Um, I'm actually meeting when I get home with a group from Monsanto and some of the senior UK farmers. Um, we just got a group together with some senior media advisors just to put, put some detail on it. A lot of it is fueled by um, political issues in France and Germany. Um, it's just another thing they can use to bash, bash farmers. There's absolutely no evidence, credible evidence, anywhere in the world that it is a definite carcinogen. Um, it's a possible, but then you know, known carcinogen is coffee, and known carcinogen is, eat, is drinking hot liquids over 65 degrees Celsius. It's absolutely crazy that they're lumping glyphosate, but it's a real possibility. Um, and if we lose it, we will have to farm without it. Um, and I'm sure there's a way, because I tend to be a fairly optimistic kind of guy, but it will be a challenge. It would be much easier to have it and use it sparingly. I think a lot of the problem is that farmers use it pre-harvest in the UK. They will go out and spray a canola crop off to desiccate it, and then that crop, which is then eaten, is the, the glyphosate is directly on the food source. And a lot of farmers would spray off wheat as well pre-harvest, so you're spraying glyphosate straight onto the food source. Whereas to use it to kill off a cover crop or a regrowth or whatever, I think is, should, be, should be allowed and encouraged, but I would happily lose the facility of pre-harvest yeah. Roundup in order to keep glyphosate. Okay, I have a final question here, and it's, it's maybe something that you can go back to your slides, I'm not sure. It says, uh, show the cross slot design. And so I think we're looking for more definition. You'll have to come to my work breakout session tomorrow. Wonderful, that's a, a great um, answer. A whole load of slides on the cross slot tomorrow. Wonderful. Okay, and there was another part, uh, ferric phosphate used for slugs. Yep. That's what you're using? Yeah, we use, it's called slux in the UK, but it's ferric phosphate. Okay. Um, we don't use any um, metaldehyde. Okay. That's great. So any other questions you'll get in the breakout session? Appreciate it very much. Uh, let's show our appreciation. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple things just as we're getting ready for our next